are coming tonight. My name is Crystal Weber. I am the admin for the ESL EAL Freelance Masterclass group where this is streaming live. And I am also the CEO, founder, curriculum developer at Crystal Clear ESL. I'm joined today by Daniel Shaw, who is a bit of a jack of all trades when it comes to ESL and teaching in general. So Daniel, do you want to do an introduction of your yourself? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Crystal. And Welcome. Hi everyone. Thanks for uh, yeah. Thanks for joining. Uh, yeah. So yeah, as you said, Crystal, my name's Daniel. Um, this is my eleventh year of teaching English. Um, spent time teaching in the UK uh, in high schools and uh, colleges. Um, I taught in South Korea for four years at all levels. Uh, I'm now in Canada, teaching at the university level. So it's mainly uh, graduate and postgraduate students, and then also in my free time or in my other time. Uh, develop curriculum. Um, I also teach online as well. That's a pretty big bulk of what I do um, and work with a lot of different lesson materials, which I'll be sharing with you a little bit today. Perfect. Thanks, Daniel. And he's right. Welcome, everyone. If you don't mind keeping yourself on mute for the time being, I have polled a lot of the groups and the group members to find out what the burning questions are regarding lesson planning. So I'll buzz through some of those with Daniel. And if uh, we leave any loose ends or you want to dig a little deeper, there'll be an opportunity at the end of our call today to ask further questions. With that, Daniel, why is it important to plan for your online ESL lessons? <laughs> That's a great question and not necessarily an easy one to answer, but let me try to break it down into a, a couple of different parts. So it's important to plan your lessons, A, because you have a structure for yourself, um, and B, most importantly, you have a structure for your students. Now, a lot of times, we might deviate from that plan. We might kind of go off and just, you know, get into a different train of conversation or spend more time on an activity that we want. But I think it's really crucial that we plan well and over plan um, so that A, we're getting the most out of the time we have with the student. And most importantly, the student is getting the most out of their experience or their time with us um, as a teacher. Absolutely. Do you think students ever choose teachers because of their materials or is it strictly sort of a personality based choice? Without sounding too salesy, I would probably say that people buy from people and students probably invest in teachers in the same way. Um, now, if you have good materials and good content to back up your personal skills, that's a really key um, quality that students do look for. Um, I know in my experience uh, teaching online that a lot of my students have come to me because I've said to them in the first the first time we meet or if we have a kind of a, a trial lesson or we just kind of assess skills. Um, you know, I, I say I have a set plan to go from A to B in, in this amount of time and obviously work with them to understand their goals and kind of modify the materials to fit their purpose. So yeah, it's it's really important. But I think the most important thing is you. So be yourself. Right, right. So you're the first thing and then uh, your materials are second. But mm -hmm. I think that they sort of go hand in hand, don't they? Because yeah. um, the more prepared you are, the more confident of a teacher you are, the more you can draw from all of these varied sources and activities and really knock the socks off your students. And I mm -hmm. think that students, especially in those first few lessons of free trial, etc. That's one of the first things they'll suss out about you is are you a prepared teacher and an exacting teacher and proficient in your subject matter? Or are you just like chucking it together last minute on the fly? So yeah, I would agree with you that they're both really important. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. So as ESL teachers, where can we find lesson content? Probably not. Look? not a good idea to just google something because we've all done it i've done it myself i've been guilty of it and i end up spending hours trying to find something that doesn't really fit um, but again starting out it, it is difficult so i would say some really good places to start depending on what you're teaching and the ability and age you're teaching um, there is a really good resource site called twinkle um, yeah. have you heard of that crystal yeah, yeah. absolutely it's huge yeah, here in the uk so, yeah twinkle is fantastic that's t-w-i-n-k-l you want to make a note of that. Um, it's really useful because, especially for younger learners, if we're doing reading, grammar, writing, um, it doesn't just have worksheets, but it has PowerPoints, it has interactive eBooks, um, and it has a lot of really good materials. So 
at times when I'm trying to um, plan lessons for maybe younger students, I'll draw from that as a resource because I can take a PowerPoint, I can take a worksheet, I can take a book, and then we can I can mesh those together to meet what the student needs. Um, and there's yeah. a lot of stuff that's kind of ready to go as well, um, but I'll come to that later, how we shouldn't necessarily just follow that, but uh, that's right. one really good place. Another really good one, depending if you're a little bit more, um, you know, let's say more advanced learners or more proficient learners, um, there's another one in the UK, TES, uh, which is the Times Education Supplement. Um, this is great for curriculum. So if students are learning, you know, high school or middle school English or math or science, it doesn't necessarily have to just be English. There's a lot of really useful resources on there as well. Um, also quite a few free ones um, on there. I, I know I, I, I do post uh, my materials on tests and I do find um, that it's a good idea if you're selling materials to have a bit of uh, free, a few free materials as well as paid ones. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are a lot of really good free resources as well. Um, one more that I might suggest for you um, when you're looking for resources is Teachers Pay Teachers. I think that's right. what it's called. Is that right, Crystal? Correct me yeah, if I'm wrong. Yeah, it is. Yeah. That's um, right. Again, this is um, a little bit more tricky because you, ha you have to either contribute or you have to pay a small amount to access those materials. But I'm sure most of us, if we're teaching online, we have something useful that we can contribute. So if we, if we submit some um, materials, we can get some back. Um, in that way, that's how you pay, or you could just physically pay <laughs> with money as well. Right. And with the satisfaction that you're actually helping somebody else out, you know, mm -hmm. teachers pay teachers is what it says on the box. It it's does, not yeah. a big company in terms of who's uh, contributing to that. They are individuals, which mm -hmm. I always feel is a bit heartwarming. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. What's important to look for, though? How do you narrow it down? Well, this really comes from knowing your learner and knowing your student and what they enjoy and what motivates them and, and obviously what their goals are. Um, if they're young learners whose parents want them to read, then I think it's really important to find books or um, content that's, first of all, suitable for their level. That's the most important. And we'll talk about that a little later. And secondly, um, topics or subjects or, you know, content that's going to appeal to them. Um, so not necessarily, not, not with gender stereotyping or anything like that. I would never want to do that. But, um, you know, if, if students tell me that they really enjoy sports or they really enjoy food or they really enjoy travel, then we can start to tailor some materials towards that. And even if the entire lesson isn't centered around that, if we can just have one or two elements that show the student or the learner or the parents, okay, this teacher is understanding my student, uh, my son, daughter, their understanding, what they need or what makes them motivated because a lot of times you know students have a lot of lessons a lot of material a lot of classes to study and want to make sure that time's fun enjoyable and also they remember something so that that hook can really help them i think yeah, absolutely that's what keeps them coming back long term mm -hmm. isn't it? sure definitely so what types of activities have you found work best for I don't know, let's say teens. Do you have much experience with that? I do. Yeah, it's really difficult because you have to straddle the line. I, I've had some students who are very, very proficient in English and they're maybe 12 or 13 years old. And I'm thinking, oh, I can just pitch at a higher level as I would to an adult, but yeah. that's not always the case. So with maybe teenagers as an example, the pitch has to kind of be a little bit down the middle. So we need to still have those fun elements where we you know, have some color or we have some videos for a couple of minutes or maybe something where we're more conversational than just strictly, okay, textbook, ABC. Uh, we can have a little bit of that elements of the textbook, but maybe we combine that with some more speaking activities or creative activities. Um, yeah. I think that's, that's what's really important. For the younger ones, it's all about getting them to speech, speak as much as possible, giving yeah. feedback as often as possible, uh, and then getting them to constantly connect and correct. I say connect and correct. That's a nice little mantra that I like to use um, throughout yeah. the lessons as well. That's awesome. I also find that um, although you you wouldn't think it with teens because they're often too cool, they usually do love games and really interactive, do. you know, yes. experiences. Especially if it's like competitive teacher versus student. 
even if they wouldn't, you know, admit to it among their friends, when it's mm-hmm. like one to one or a small group, they they'll often quite uh, go for that sort of thing. So that's true. One one thing just to comment on that, Crystal, is it's fine to only use games little and often. Don't yeah. spend 15, 20 minutes of a lesson on that, yes. um, because especially. For a lot of us, when parents are close by or hovering, if they if they just see their child playing games constantly, they might not get the full picture. So it's a yeah. really good point, but they are they are great and are useful. But obviously, just try to yeah. use it as kind of a reward or a motivation or a, a kind of a, a plenary at the end right. of the lesson. Right. Right. And parents aren't usually educators either, so they often don't get the sort of educational side of a game, mm-hmm. especially when they're only like looking over a shoulder or overhearing from across the room. So right. yeah, you're absolutely right to be really careful with that. Definitely. Okay. Should we expect to teach lessons off the shelf? So we were searching the internet, we find this great curriculum. Can we just apply it across the board to every student? Absolutely not. No, I can't go into a clothing store and buy the same shirt as everyone else because even though I might be a similar size to most people or, you know, I might have the same taste, everyone's different. I mean, it's a very simple analogy, but you can definitely get materials that need a little tweaking, maybe 10, 15 minutes of tweaking. Um, but don't just take things off the shelf because again, we're also trusting each other and sometimes when we're in a rush and we're just uploading things there might be typos or spelling errors or features of slides don't work or the um, audio or videos are not correctly linked so i do understand that it's really tempting to sometimes just say okay i'll just quickly search this download it looks great great and then get into the class and be in that moment because we've all been there and i've been there too um so For me, what I've tried to do, it takes time, and I'm sure you can um, expand on this as well, Crystal, is over time I've developed kind of materials that I've taken and I've I've kind of tailored them in a way that works for me and my students. So I'll find an article, but I won't just copy that article. I'll take certain elements of it and focus on paragraph by paragraph, okay? Then I can add questions in instead of just downloading one worksheet, which might have all that. Um, that. Is that something you do, Crystal, or is this some some uh, some of this is resonating with you yeah i mean absolutely um first off in in terms of just rocking up to a lesson and expecting it to be perfect and then you're going to pull off something all singing all dancing it's really Mm. not going to happen so even if it's just a case of flipping through the slides and knowing what to expect um i i come from a background of contracted esl teaching where you can be a very lazy teacher and Mm -hmm literally just rock up for your lesson and go through the slides and 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 that's done so um how i tend to go about it is yes you vaguely want to find material that suits your learner but then a lot of times you can use supplementary materials or props or rewards i i use manicam for example Mm -hmm. to target your learner and gain their interest in that way instead so that you know they're still covering the same um you know uh, signposted grammar points along a curriculum just like any other student but you're making it appeal to them (laughs) in a slightly different way exactly Yeah. yeah yeah i think that's that's definitely true yeah cool okay Um, if I find something on the internet, can I just Mm. use it? What are the rules? Mm, Again, probably not. Um, you know, there's, there is a lot of legal gray areas as well with a lot of things and we have to be really careful how we manipulate and use materials that we find. Um, I've personally had the experience where other teachers or other schools have used my material without my consent and Again, I'm happy to share things and, you know, provide uh, resources. But <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I wouldn't like it done to me. Now, that's yeah. not to say that I can, you know, that I can't take something I found and maybe twist, you know, give it a twist and use it in my own way. Yeah, recreate um, if, it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You know, if, if some of us, I like to put things um, in slides or you, if you have an LMS that you use, you can do that as well. Um, you know, I think when we... When we borrow from from one person, it's plagiarism. But when we borrow from many, it's research. So again, just get a few different elements in there that work for your learners. Um, Mm -hmm. And again, try to put your kind of stamp and your kind of branding on it um, so that 
again, like we mentioned earlier, students come to you because you're a great teacher, first of all, but secondly, you have that foundation of that great content and material to back it up as well. Yeah, totally agree. I think there is an increasing gray area, really, because um, mm. as uh, schools like OutSchool and Italki and Preply mm -hmm. or you know, these um, create a profile or teacher marketplace type companies come about, they employ thousands of teachers, but don't provide the material. So then these teachers often want to go and uh, subscribe elsewhere or uh, download this or that, which is fine to an extent. Um, the thing about publishing rights is that publishers often open their rights for use in like public schools and, and for right. mainstream education, but not necessarily for commercial, private, uh, for-profit use. So Absolutely. even things like um, sharing a, an extract from a novel, like Harry Potter, for example, wouldn't be allowed in a commercial setting because that's for personal gain. It's not for public education. So it is important, I think, like you said, Daniel, to, to tread carefully with that. Mm -hmm. just 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 to um just to kind of expand on something you just said i actually do teach the bulk of my online lessons on italki and the way that i help myself stand out from the crowd because there's a lot of teachers on there is to have a really succinct well-planned profile that explains everything really nicely and then in the classes that i offer this is it's not a class it's a one-off it's a course so you're going to go through a b c d you know all the way through Mm -hmm. um, and that seems to appeal to learners really well. Um, and also it helps me because I can offer different courses um, yeah. and I can obviously, again, show my personal qualities as well as the material to back it up, like we said earlier. Oh, that's really cool. That is mm -hmm. good. And by using your own material too, you've got that extra sort of enticement. It's there in the bank, right? And we can use it and reuse <laughs> yeah. it and repurpose it as we need to, which is, which is really useful. Good. Okay, cool. Uh, what does a lesson plan look like to you? Um, it depends pretty much on the learner and the class and the type of class that you're teaching. So I teach a lot of different uh, things. I teach a lot of different courses and um, online lessons. So if I'm teaching a reading class for a, you know, a young learner, um, I will generally have the, the, the reading or the book or the story I'll have that in there. I'll have the materials uh, in there as well. Now, I don't necessarily have a lesson plan. I have an outline, so it's not detailed um, because if I have 40 minutes with a student and we're reading, essentially that's what we're doing. And over time, once you build up that comfortable, you know, style and that kind of familiarity, you don't really need to plan essentially in a detailed way. You just need to think, okay, this is what we're doing. This is the plan. However, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't reflect and you shouldn't get feedback on a regular basis because Ooh, the biggest problem that a lot of us make, or I don't want to generalize, but the, the biggest problem a lot of us seem to experience is we might be doing really well when we start teaching online and then things get quiet and students drop off and we're kind of thinking, well, I'm doing everything the same, so why is that happening? That's the problem. We need to constantly <laughs> try to, you know, keep things yeah. moving, keep change, not changing for changing sake, but adapting and responding to feedback. Um, so if I'm teaching, let's say a, advanced, you know, a graduate student who needs um, work on their writing or their speaking, um, that'll be a lot more detailed. That'll be a lot more structured. Um, mm -hmm. For example, I might ask them to provide a piece of writing. Okay, so then we're gonna go through that writing, feedback on the writing. Then we take that writing and we develop it or we use it as a conversation point. So. It really depends on the learner. It, it really depends on the type of lesson that you have. Um, the the one the kind of the one we need to really be careful of is free talking or free conversation. That should be planned because there is nothing worse than that. That silence, prolonged silence, a few seconds, here and there. That's great, especially for the student. But we need to kind of plan that out. What are we going to talk about? What are a list of twenty or thirty things that we can discuss? And how are we going to develop from simple, easy, closed questions to longer developed open questions to develop? So, Oh, yeah. such a good point. Definitely. So do you, you said that it can be de detailed or more vague or more detailed depending on how the, the needs of the student are. But 
do you have to be like a trained curriculum developer? Do you have to be a skilled linguist? Absolutely <laughs> not. Plan? So if you visit those um, those sites we mentioned earlier, a lot of them have free lesson planning, uh, free lesson planning um, materials and lesson plans. You can just download. I think I've even put one up there myself for teachers. So you don't have to be an expert. Again, with teaching, with anything you do, the more you do it, the easier it becomes. And once you find your rhythm and what you enjoy and, and what the students enjoy, then you don't have to be you know, an expert. It might be really useful just to see some examples of what a good lesson plan looks like. So you can start to um, tailor that to your students, but I don't think we have to be experts now. Right, okay, perfect. So anybody can do it. Absolutely. Just do it, just dive in. It's not too difficult, especially once you you kind of get a groove for it. And we have but this then, great community, right? So if you if yeah. you have developed a lesson plan and you say, you know, can you give me some feedback? I'm sure we'll all be happy to do that because it's a learning opportunity for us as well. Oh, that would be super fun. I hope some people mm -hmm. do do that. So then a lot of uh, curricula are available on the web and people spend a lot of time talking about how important they are more than just individual le uh, lessons mm. themselves. So why is a curriculum important? A curriculum is important because when you first work with a student or you meet a student, you need to show them the, the destination where we're going to get to and your curriculum is, is the journey, how you're going to get there. Um, so if I just say to you, Crystal, okay, we're going to meet uh, for 30 minutes every week and we're just going to talk. Probably after two or three weeks, you're going to think, well, I'm paying this money and we're talking and great. I like to speak English or I like to talk, but what, what, what am I achieving? You know, what's my, um, what's my goal? What am I getting out of this? And we find that students drop off or they might just continue out of maybe, you know, politeness or whatever, but we're not really doing doing ourselves and the student um, the best service that we can do. So if we have a great curriculum, we can say, okay, my goals are one, two, three, four, five. Set those goals at the beginning, uh, the first time we meet. Okay, now we need to actively work towards those goals. Then I can show you, I'm accountable to you as, as a teacher. Here we are, we're working on this, this skill. We're working on this goal. Have we achieved it partially? Okay, are we starting to? We're working towards it and we can check those off we can work our way through so that by the end of the 10 or 15 or 20 or however many lessons it is that student can then say yep yeah, i have asked for this you have delivered this wonderful i'm happy you're happy let's continue learning or let's try something else or yeah. let's uh let me introduce you to my uh, my children or my son or my daughter yeah. or my husband because that's happened a lot of times with me because students feel like okay i can trust this, this teacher, and that's a really important part. Um, you know, they're, they're doing their best for me. They're trying to, they're listening, they're responding, they're, you know, creating things that I need to, to suit me, um, and they're getting value for money. And again, we, we work hard and we all deserve to be paid well, but we also have to give back to our students in the same token, because it's got to be a reciprocal exchange. Indeed, indeed. I think you've touched upon what I consider to be the two most important um, things that we provide for our students, and that's enjoyment and a love of learning English mm -hmm. and progress and, and yeah. signposted progress so that the student or the parent can see you come from A and now you're at D and you're going to F you know, mm -hmm. and the time frame involved too so that goals can be set and people can be accountable as well. This is why, as, as a curriculum developer myself, I, I agree that um, the curricula are so important. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. So you want, you've got a curriculum set out in front of you. You want to ascertain where a new student is on that curriculum. What level or lesson do you start them at? How do you mm -hmm. go about assessing student levels? So in my first, uh, let's say it's a uh, young children, we're doing a reading or an ESL class. Um, I'll, I won't just have one thing planned for them. I'll have three things open. And in that first five to seven, maybe 10 minutes, I'll start out with very simple, very basic questions to ascertain where they're at. Um, and then usually, and not, not always, but usually I'm sure it's the same for you, Crystal, is after two or three minutes, you're either like, wow, we need to start very basic or wow, this student's 
really proficient, we can we can get right up here. So yeah, because you start at what you think is going to be like a middle ground, yeah. right? Yeah. Now um, another way you can also do this is to assign some pre uh, tasks. So sometimes I ask students if they can write a, an introduction. Um, if that's too much, then maybe just tell me some of their favorite things. And that can also really tell a lot about that student as well. Mm -hmm. They just write a few lines, um, even though we're not seeing them and speaking to them, um, it does tell us a lot in terms of their ability. Um, with older learners or you know maybe high schoolers or um, adult learners, you can also maybe give some online placement tests. I know Oxford has a couple of different ones that they can do, which can give a, a relative level of their proficiency. Um, yeah. So those are great tools as well. But in the first instance, always have two or three different things prepared. And even if you feel like this curriculum would be good, but it's not quite perfect, then we can start to tweak it and change it. So some right. easy ways you can do that is adding difficulty to questions, adding layers of detail, adding more open philosophical kind of statements and, and that kind of thing and, and getting them to maybe um, guide the learning as opposed to you. Right. Yeah. Using more inference and so, so on. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. Okay. So what if there's a disparity between one skill and another? For example, the student's quite proficient in speaking and can engage in, you know, advanced conversation, but their reading is, uh, you know, several levels lower. Yeah, that's pretty common in, in a lot of cases. So what we do with that is we obviously need to focus on all four skills but we just maybe give a little more time and attention to those other skills. So if it's reading, instead of just speaking about the text, why don't we do some comprehension questions? Let's look at some reading skills. Let's look at some um, more kind of investigative reading as opposed to just talking about it. Okay, well, what does this mean? Or which words um, show this? Yeah. Or are there any certain phrases or synonyms? So we can start to build all of them. You can't just you can't just say, okay, you need to work on reading, so we're only going to do reading. Um, right, it's still going to be a mix of those four skills. It has you to might, be. You might just yeah. have a sort of slant, slant toward one or two of them. Yeah. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and I would say, again, with, with the younger learners as well, they're probably strongest at speaking, um, if they've had some exposure to that. Um, what you would then do is you'd have like a lot of short activities, short games within the lesson, which focus on those other skills. So we're not saying, you're great at speaking, but you're terrible at everything else. It's more of a subtle way of, okay, let's spend a few minutes on this. Mm -hmm. Reading, okay, correct that reading. What does this word mean? Um, yeah. Why, how do you think the character's feeling? Or where are they right now? So you can use those W questions for elicitation. Yeah. Um, and then maybe at the end, okay, could you tell me in one, one sentence what's going on, what's happening? Um, and then that way you can get writing in. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, there's, there's a lot of little tricks and things that you can do, um, and I'll be That's happy clever. to, to give, give some afterwards, but um, yeah, right. I think so it's basing just about... The, basing sorry. the lesson on one specific skill, but then elaborating and drawing in the other yeah, three. You have to have elements that. of all of them, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cool. That's really good. So how do you, we've talked a lot about progress, but how do you make sure that your student is making consistent progress? It can be really difficult to measure progress um, in, a, in a tangible way. Um, I do a lot of teaching for IELTS, so some students, they want to improve their proficiency and that's a really, not, a, not an easy way, but an easier way um, to measure progress. With younger students, um, what I'll generally do is I'll have kind of um, stories or books that are set more at uh, a certain age range and then we can progress through the ranges at once they, you know, once I'm confident that they're hitting everything. So mm -hmm. we'll start off with the younger students, um, you know, books that are more visual, less words, and then we have more words, less visual until we get to a certain stage. And you can check that progress through comprehension questions, through um, summary tasks, through reflections. Um, that can be a nice way to help you with that. Um, also with uh, writing as well, I would say it's more about looking at a piece of text how well do they connect ideas how well do they join ideas what are the major errors that they're having in the frequency of those errors um, so it depends again sorry to say on the type of lesson and the type of student but you can you can measure that and you don't have to give tests to, to measure that it can just be activities or homeworks or little little games or um, plenaries within the lesson that are disguised as fun 
activities, yeah. whereas they might be little tests or quizzes. And also right. a really, really valuable way is to, at the end of the class, what's one thing you learned today? Or what's the most interesting thing you learned today? Or can you tell me a fact that you learned from the book or something like that? And then the real progress comes at the next class. Do you remember the book we read last week? What was it? Who was it? Who was it about? Where was it set? And again, those questions connect and build that deep thinking that's really important for progress. Wow, super important. Mm -hmm. I also am a huge purporter of feeding back on yeah. progress. I, I probably overdo it with feedback because my students get like a good paragraph after every 25 minute lesson that outlines, mm -hmm. you know, where they did really well a few things to boost their confidence. Um, I'll remind them of the homework and then I will also sort of sandwich in there something for them to work on. And that way, so I teach younger kids, but that way their parents can see where they've come yes. from, what they've mastered and what still needs a little bit of work. And I try because I find um, it's difficult with young kids and over the internet and paid classes because parents, quite often can't have you in three, four, five times a week. But language learners really need that really steady mm -hmm. um, interaction That's with the language. So things like um, little homework tasks or little games to play at home with their parents or a little reading exercise or book um, can really facilitate that progress even more to get their parents involved. And parents love homework. They do. Yeah. <laughs> And you can make it fun. It doesn't have to be onerous or heavy. Absolutely. It can still, you know, review a skill or touch upon something to come in a fun way. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Good. Good point. Um, but I think it gets really heavy with something you have a lot of experience in. It's the exam preparation because you mm -hmm. mentioned earlier about the IELTS exam. I don't have a lot of experience in this. And um, to be quite frank, I don't want to because <laughs> I feel like the pressure is really, you know, high on the teacher yes. to produce those results that the, the student wants. So how do you deal with that, Daniel? You have to be honest and you have to be realistic with that student because, yeah. again, you're doing them a disservice because some, again, some teachers, I'm not going to say where or, or when or how, but some of them might say, oh, that's no problem. I can definitely do that. Well, you every student's different and <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Right. A, a lot of it comes down to the student's own motivation and their kind of their approach and their way of thinking about something. Because a lot of the time when we, when we have a goal or a target um, as a teacher, we have to try to kind of open the minds of our students and uh, do a lot of relearning because a lot of the time students aren't where they're not where they want to be or their parents are not where they want them to be because perhaps they have learned some bad habits or mm -hmm. they are just very stubborn in the way that they do things um or so, they've been out of it for a while right so with that it's kind of this is what i can do for you these are the steps i cannot make any guarantees or promises however I will give you all the tools, all the support, all the guidance, and everything you need to succeed. But I can only hold your hand so far, right? There's a certain yeah. point where they need to kind of walk alone for, for part of it. But um, I generally find as well that, you know, if, you, if you're really good at what you do and you really enjoy what you do, that'll come across to the student and they'll be more willing to, to give back and try to do those things um, because if we're feeling as if oh, the student's a little bit difficult or I don't really want to teach them, but they've paid for the course now, so I'm going to have to, that comes across, not directly, but it comes across. And then that'll sometimes be reflected in the, in the responses or the, the homework that you get back. So right. definitely try to be positive and be realistic and be honest. And I think students will respect that and they'll hopefully um, go along with you, provided that you can do those things. Great. Okay, cool. So, if your student uh, isn't putting in the effort or they're finding it too difficult, what, what can you do as a teacher? So yeah, that's a really good point. Um, and a lot, this goes back to what we said earlier about having a curriculum. You, you never teach a set curriculum. It has to be, here is my curriculum, but I'm going to deviate slightly and move things around. It's like a jigsaw, right? You have to kind of right. put the pieces in the right place. So on the, let's say in a class, I'm teaching a student and I thought, oh, when they were speaking last week, they were really, you know, 
confident and comfortable and they were you know making very few errors so i can i can pitch this and 10 minutes in you realize this is probably not their level so what can you do um in my experience when this has happened i will very quickly because i have two screens <laughs> i'll very quickly skip ahead and either remove some questions this is very difficult to do wow. so i wouldn't advise this um, another really important thing that you can do as well is to just kind of put a break into your class say, okay so for the next three minutes we're just going to quickly read this i'm going to ask you some questions so be ready to answer those questions so you can put some <laughs> artificial breaks in there to help you um, uh -huh. and then with some of the questions as well you can say okay let's do them together let's look at this word let's break it down so you can spend more time on some of the the easier activities so in the more difficult ones you can either backload them for later or you can just kind of you know not use them if that's not going to work so what you should do um, in the class is focus more spend more time on the activities spend more time on the easier things and again it's it comes it comes with experience um, and time management as well it's really really difficult to do but with enough time and experience you can say all right before we move on um let's take a look at this page what do you see in the background so what do you think the weather's like today so how do you think the characters are feeling and right. what color is this is this the same as this is something different so again you can just kind of direct students in other ways and get them to think about other things if the text is too difficult or the questions are too difficult um so there's lots of different techniques that you can definitely use to, right. to help you meet that i love that i love the idea of just spending more time i mean yeah we're our own bosses with this job for the most part. So if you don't mm -hmm. get through everything you plan, because maybe you weren't on the mark uh, proficiency wise, you can spend more time on one activity in that lesson and then feed things through to your, your next classes mm -hmm. exactly. and develop each of them in more detail because that's with, what you're doing. Yeah. With young learners, the last thing we want to do is make them anxious or overwhelmed. Yeah. And you know, it, when I see that happening to, to my to the young ones that I teach, I generally just slow it right down. Yes. And I'll ask them, you know, something maybe related to the story. So if the if the characters are eating, I'll say, Oh, so did you, what did you eat for, for breakfast this morning? Oh, I had right. this. What did you have? Okay. Yeah. And then you can start to get them back in terms of feeling more comfortable. And then you can just focus a little more on things and yeah. just take your time because a lot of time when students say nothing. Sometimes they genuinely don't know, but other times they just need that thinking time and we think <gasps> silence, mm -hmm. they don't get anything, which is not always the case. Oh gosh. And then there's that parent giving them the answer. <laughs> I'm sure you've all been I there. Won't, I won't get into the topic of parents uh, because the parents we'll be here for a long time. A topic for another month, right? <laughs> <I think so. laughs> How to deal so. with parents. That pretty much sums up all the questions that I brought with me, but do you mm -hmm. have any final food for thought or top tips for us? Um, it takes a lot of time. I've been teaching online exclusively for the last three years. And when I started out and I think back to my first lessons, I think, what was I doing? No, why did I do that? And you have to, you have to be prepared to fail. And by fail, I don't mean think I can't do this anymore. It's yeah. all right. I need to make sure that I do this next time. So be reflective and maybe think back if you've done three or four lessons in a day, maybe the end of the day or at the end of the week, think, okay, what could I have done better? So I've gone from a system where I just had a, I was doing conversational classes. I've just gone from a system where I had a word document with some questions. Hmm. Okay. This is fine, I guess, but I want the students to get more out of it. Why are they going to choose me over the other millions of teachers? All right. So instead of just a word document with questions, let me find out what they do for work, what their hobbies are, what their interests are. Let me build themes around yeah. these lessons. Let me put them into visuals. Let me have really high quality, engaging visuals with the questions in there. Let's connect them to an article for reading so they can do reading practice. Let's have a rhythm reflection as homework. And then you can go from something very simple from a crumb and you can build it up. And now I have five or six different curricula, which I've put together over three, four years, which is not off the shelf, but it's oven ready. There we go. That's my expression that I use. <laughs> Just got to put in some salt and pepper and get it seasoned and then it's good to go. So yeah. I love that oven ready. Yeah. I'm going to file that one away. Thank you so much, Daniel. So, no um, we've got several people watching live. We've got yeah. several people in the room right now. 
If anyone has any questions, please feel free now to type them into the comments or take yourself off mute and ask them here. We're here for the next few minutes to just elaborate on anything. Um, yeah. We'll give more examples. And um, if anyone is interested in, in finding out more about online teaching or they want to teach, obviously we have the group. Can I, could I also plug my podcast, Crystal? Would that be okay? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I totally forgot to mention that. I didn't. I've been touting it in the adverts, but I said, I it's forgot called to mention it. yes. ESL Talk. Am I right? Yeah, it's on all the podcast um, hosting platforms. We have a new season starting on Wednesday. Um, so please feel free to give it a listen and hopefully um, if there's a couple of things you can learn from it, then that would be wonderful. It is great. I love the podcast. So you should definitely tune in. Absolutely. I'll be happy to stick around and answer any questions. Cool. Okay. Uh, yes, it is recorded. Uh, maps. And it's streamed to the group. So it will actually auto, auto save to the, to the ESL EAL freelance masterclass. Good question. Anything else? I think, you know, I'm not actually very surprised that we're not getting floods of questions because I think you did a great job of covering so many topics in lesson planning. Mm -hmm. Jamie, Hi. do you have one? I do. Hi. 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 Thank Welcome. you. Thank you for great information. Crystal, I've been following you in the groups. Um, Yay. Welcome. So I had never considered teaching online before um, independently. I've been working with VIP Kid for five years, um, but I have had a bit more than a handful of regular parents pretty much insisting that I stay with them. Um, I'm aware that this may not be able to continue for a long time. For now, I've told them that I can't do it while I'm still under contract, but that I and that I need time because I'm new at this. Um, mm -hmm. Most parents have been really great, and so I've been doing a lot of research, which is why I'm here about how to design curriculum. Um, of course, from working with a VIP kid for years, I have a lot of ideas about what to include and how to go about mm -hmm. teaching reading and grammar. But I have one parent specifically um, who keeps telling me that she wants this book used or this book used. Mm -hmm. Um, I live abroad. I move countries and I'm also not a brick and mortar teacher and I don't want to come right out and tell her. So I did just recently in email yesterday tell her, look, I don't know if you're aware, I don't work at a local school. She keeps telling me to get these resources at my local school. I said, however, I'm looking into designing something for reading. I told her I'm looking at um, reading A to Z and Raz Kids and then I'm, yes. I'm researching it. Um, right. I'm looking into doing reading comprehension with a bit of grammar included, which is kind of, I figure that will easily cover a 30 minute class. Mm -hmm. Um, and her daughter is about seven, you know, and, um, she came back with me. Well, I have, and a lot of my friends have these books that we want you to teach from and I will send them to you. So oh, wow. I haven't even responded. Um, but so, I mean, I, I told her hopefully by the end of the year, I said, right now I need time, you know, to sort this out. My question specifically for creating curriculum. Um, so I've been looking at things, platforms like Classin and Zoom, and I understand that you can upload things, click on them, show them, teach them. I'm really not very good with computers. I didn't grow up with them. I'm a bit older. Um, how would you go about designing curriculum from a book that she sends me? I'm imagining you would like take a chapter and focus on that and go chapter to chapter. What, I mean, I don't understand. Would you scan the worksheets and the, and, and upload them? Do you want them? me to, do you want me yeah. to yeah. this Yeah. 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 Do you want to start? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I've, I've had to do this. It's a really good question. And how do you do that? I've had some, some, some parents who've said, I only want to do this writing book or this reading book, like you said. Um, what I have done that, that works really well is whatever platform you want to use, you can either keep it super simple, Google Slides or even PowerPoint, they can achieve the same thing. Your best friend is control, oh sorry, let me say this again, okay, hold on. Windows key, shift and S, that is your best friend. Windows key, shift and S. Shift S, okay, what will that do? The Windows key, know. shift, it will do a screen grab. So if you have a PDF, 
or you have an online version of anything or whatever's on your screen, Windows key, Shift and S, I'm just gonna do it now. Yes, it does work. That will create a, a box that you can drag and you can, whatever is in that box will copy. So what I have done in the past, some visuals or some you know materials, instead of me typing everything out or you know rewriting everything, there's some elements that I want, I can just put those into a slide directly. And then I can type my own questions or my own material afterwards. Okay, sense? so use like Google Documents. Take her up her book that I've uploaded. I'm, that oh, I'm not sure me. about her book, but I just mean oh, yeah, to book, create a book. So you're yeah. talking about an online book, so I can just grab that page and anything just on your drag it. anything on your screen. So what I, what I okay. do for my reading reading lessons, for example, is the stories that I have. They're not like real published books. They're more just kind of user created stories. So okay. with those, I can take the, the images, all the images, I can grab them, put them into slides, then I can see what the story is, I can grab them, put them on top of the, the images, and then the questions, the worksheets, instead of printing them or doing something separate, I can again just grab the questions that I want, mm -hmm. I can add more if I want, I can take more off, and then it's all there in one, one okay. uh, PDF or one slideshow or whatever. Yeah. Okay, that's great. And. Um... And I've been looking at your curriculum as well. Is there a membership fee annually or is it the $9 per month and you have access to the levels? Yes, Crystal. Uh, yeah, so there's a monthly membership. I am exploring the idea of an annual fee instead, but for the moment, while it's all still in development, it's a monthly. It is changing because um, the level one, which is a kind of standalone phonics unit, is gonna split off in the coming kind of week or two. Um, so if if you want sort of the whole lower curriculum as a bundle, I would go for it now. Okay, <laughs> gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. But, but I guess what I'm asking, so there's no, like, there's no um, like membership fee, it's just the monthly payment? Right, so, and, then, and the thing to keep in mind with it is it's all purposely uh, built for online delivery for commercial purposes. So Daniel and I were speaking earlier about how uh, you have to sort of tread carefully with regards to copyright when you're mm -hmm. teaching commercially um, because not everything is intended for that use and, and um, can be used freely like that. But um, all of my material is intended for that use and comes with an individual commercial license as standard. So okay. you don't so have to you worry only about that. If I only have a few students that would be between the levels one and four that you have developed now, I could teach them as long as needed and then just discontinue if I don't yeah. need them any longer. Okay, great. That's right, know. yeah. The difference to teaching the Crystal Clear ESL curriculum to from like a book like you mentioned is that um, you, you would screen share it rather than like uploading, downloading and all of that faff because your online portal through my website is your own library. So it's quite easy then, like Daniel was saying, how sometimes you need to scale up or scale down your material. So by having like 200, 300, 400 lessons at your fingertips all organized really succinctly, you just literally, you know, open what you need and go and okay. it's all just there. And okay. you talked before about um, the platform to use and, and whether it is for my curriculum or anything, what you need is a platform that can do screen share with lots of um, annotation functionality. So more potentially than just being able to write on the screen, but also can your student drag and drop? Can they uh, fill in a blank like with typed text, for example, ah, for things yeah. to investigate? Do you have, so I've do looked it. at LearnCube, I've looked at Classin, but I'm hearing Classin, my, I, I never invested in a really expensive computer, so I'm hearing Classin won't work with an i3, and I looked at it. Yeah, so I, it can get, so, get glitchy. Yeah. Okay, so LearnCube, do you have any other recommendations for platforms? Yeah, so LearnCube is good, but um, they offer their own curriculum. You, I, I, I don't saw know you, you know, can, and you buy I, that if you want to. Right, but I, I get the feeling that their platform is configured in such a way to sort of 
gear you toward using their material because the the functionality of their screen share option i.e to import another curriculum or supplementary material isn't configured as well as just streaming the learn cube stuff so far i mean they have been a real up and comer and developed really really quickly so these might be things they have in future um personally i tend to go with like the tried and tested zoom i've been using it for years I find the basic free version has the most functionality that I need. I find it's been really, really stable, whereas some others, like you mentioned with Classen, haven't been. Um, I use it together with ManyCam, the side, <laughs> and uh, it, it operates just fine because I use that for my reward system and you know graphics and things. And so, so Zoom, what about Zoom you, Daniel? Has... Which ones do you recommend? Yeah, I was going to say, uh, again, I've, I've used different things. I teach on italki. They have italki classroom, which is terrible. Um, so I just default to Zoom, and Zoom's great. I mean, we can annotate on there. We can uh, drag and drop, uh, screen share, that kind of thing. So Give control. You, can, you know, control. there's hardly any platforms out there that allow you to give control, which is essentially giving the student your mouse so it pops over to them, and they can do really? anything on the screen that you yeah. could. So and I then if you to... touch the mouse, it pops back to you. So yeah. I have Zoom, but I've only ever used it for just chatting. Can I go on there and practice all this stuff just like by myself using all this? Start a call and yeah, you can definitely try. Yeah, that's what I did. Um, yeah. There's Thank another you. one annotation. So like if you're doing, you know, matching or circling or whatever, the students can also do that on their side as well. So. Oh, that's exactly. great. Thank you. Um, so just start a meeting on Zoom and then log in on like your phone or a tablet in a different room so you don't get the interference. That's what I did. And you can then see what it looks like from both sides. Okay, so use a different email around. to log in. Okay. Good yeah, idea. because it's free, you can just sign up for two accounts and, um, okay. and do it that way. It's a great way to get comfortable with it. The give control feature on Zoom, you do have to enable within the web portal. So you just log in through your browser rather than through the Zoom app. And it's within the settings. You just go down within the main settings and you push a little button that says enable give control. And then that pops up on your annotation bar from there on in. Thank you so much. You guys have been a lot of help. Thank you. No okay, you bet. Thanks for, for asking. Okay, well, I think that that basically covers it. Um, any other questions? Daniel's a, a very welcome and knowledgeable member in our did, freelance uh, masterclass. Did just leave? <laughs> um, yeah. Maybe. Oh, no, oh. yes, she's she's here still, but she's gone quiet. Did you have something okay. else to add? I was going to share with you. Um, I actually recently oh. wrote a book about online teaching. Um, there is a free version available, Jamie, so if you'd like that, I can link you to it if you wish. Take yeah, could you put the link um, maybe in the comments here and then on the, the thread Absolutely. to the live broadcast? That would be yes. great because probably lots of people would want to take a look yeah. at that. I will be happy to share that with you guys. Cool. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this evening. It's been a fun almost hour, and I hope you gained a lot from it. Thank you so much, Daniel. It's always a pleasure to have My you. My pleasure. <laughs> All right. We'll see Enjoy everybody it. again soon. Have a great evening or day. Bye.